Hi, everyone. So Roman decided to sit on the front bench instead of standing next to me. So I feel a bit out there on the spot, but let's, let's, uh, let's do it uh, uh, by myself. Thanks for coming to our talk. Uh, we are Roman and Ben. Uh, we work in the, the scaling machine learning team at Booking.com. Um, our purpose as a team is to enable rapid model development uh, for the entire data science community. Uh, that's about 150 to 200 people. And we work in different buildings. Um, it's still growing quite fast, so new people uh, come in quite soon, and they don't always know the, the tricks that, that uh, the old, uh, old people working for several years know. Uh, so there are a lot of uh, uh, growth, uh, growth issues arising with these uh, steps. And uh, Booking itself also has a big history. We are around for 20 years by now. So if you shrink it down to a couple of sentences, then you have I think four or five Dutchies in a small room in 1996. They were arranging manual bookings over the internet in a really yeah, first old school looking website. And, and now it's about 15,000 people uh, around the world uh, working on technology in Amsterdam mostly, uh, working on customer service, thousands of people working customer service, and also thousands of people working with uh, the partners, the hotels, the apartments, bed and breakfast owners. Um, and at, uh, per day around uh, 1.5 million room nights are sold, so it's quite heavy traffic, a lot of users concurrently searching for stuff. Uh, and the technology powering all of this has been traditionally been Perl. So from day one until now, we have a really big Perl code base. And that was also the first thing I needed to learn when I started at Booking uh, three and a half years ago. Um, so 2014, I joined it, and my onboarding task was to analyze some data for some something. And, uh, everyone was using Perl. Uh, they looped over monthly statistics tables on MySQL, and then you do another loop in Perl to sum up or divide or whatever, and, and then you write it to CSV, and you move it over to other boxes to plot it in some other library. And I, I really found it horrible. I, I thought, what the hell are we doing as data, data or business analysts, we were called at that point. Um, so all my hobby projects were in R and Python. Uh, and then I moved to a company which was using Perl, and it was a bit of a shock to me. So I, I pushed a lot for R uh, and Python to be used uh, by data scientists. And yeah, the first thing I could do was a, quite a big uh, machine learning project after that. Uh, that I, what, what I was using was uh, Hive Python reducers to prepare my features. Uh, so I wrote Python code, and I submitted it offline. Uh, we used Yarn and a loop to prepare my features. Uh, that took some, quite some time to get it all running. Then I used uh, uh, a really big box with uh, 24 cores and, and uh, 100 gigs of RAM, I think, at that point, um, to, to compute a random forest with R. Uh, many people were using those boxes. You're, so you're always competing and trying to find that space of time in the day, most likely evenings, uh, when people are not using it, so you can train your models, and uh, it takes hours, and then you find some other thing that, that didn't work, and you have to redo it. So. Yeah, for me, that was all new in the first time I did it, so it was quite, I find it really, really cool to get it working. <clears throat> but uh, after a lot of time, I was done, and then I said, okay, let's go to production. And looking back, I was so naive, uh, starting this entire project and thinking that after all those efforts, I could just go to production. So then I, I um, went to the developer community, so Roman is uh, representing the developer community at Booking, and the first thing they told me, like, like you, you need to port everything to Perl. And I hated using Perl in my onboarding, so now suddenly I had to port my random forest R code to Perl, and all the features that I, I was preparing offline needed to go to Perl. And because I couldn't do this, I need, was depending on other developers to do that for me, which means I have to find and convince a team to help me with that. And that took some time, because uh, priorities are quite different from my team and, and then our teams, but I found people. Uh, I pushed it, I explained it, and then they, they implemented it for me. Uh, and then you go to uh, production, the first version is there, and we need to validate whether what is implemented is also matching what I did offline, which it was not the case. So I went to two or three iterations uh, to fix all the data skew that was appearing. Uh, the logic was implemented differently from what I did offline, so you need to work by that time with new developers because teams switch, and then you explain it again, and then at some point you say, okay, this 1% error rate is fine, let's go to production and use it. Uh, but by then, quite some time uh, went by. Um, then, by the time you're finished, uh, compared to your earlier point where you have um, uh, product owners that wanted to use your product, a lot of time went by, so the product owners switched teams or they forgot about it, so you have to re-explain uh, it and what they can do with it, and then the experiment with it, and 
uh, yeah, the thing is making a lot of money at the moment, so that's good, but it took far too much time to, to get to that point. Um, so that was my first machine learning project. And uh, 2016, uh, we discovered Spark, so we were trying out all the offline feature preparations with Spark, and we saw massive speed ups. Uh, it was really cool to see this happening. We were uh, happy to teach other people at Booking, so we organized dozens of training for people to work with Spark, and that was quite common. Um, but while doing this, the, the model that I still have in production was still being fed by the features uh, coded up in Perl, uh, and all my time was, spend, was spent on offline retraining of my model, so I had to make sure that the features were regenerated every time, so I didn't spend much time on validating the Perl stuff. Uh, and that, that kind of starts eating in your, your head. So uh, then we started experimenting with Spark Streaming, um, and we came up with some plan to uh, redo the Perl approach, but then the data scientist, me, could implement most of the logic uh, myself with Spark Streaming. We set up Kafka, we set up uh, Cassandra, uh, and we tried to integrate it and uh, yeah, make it work uh, with my, my much more involvement for me in the entire process. Um, and that's where we are now. Uh, we are now trying to integrate all these components uh, into a thing we call a feature store. Uh, I've seen the term around at other companies as well. Uh, and we like to make sure that the data scientists uh, meet the developer world in between, and that for us is Spark Scala. Because Booking now is also more using more Java, and Scala is kind of a nice way to, to plug it into uh, the Scala uh, approved uh, approach. Um, so our team now has several objectives uh, to summarize my, my experiences. We want to reduce the skew between the offline data science world and the online developer world. Uh, data scientists are these hacky uh, baby coders, one might say, and they, they, they think they know how to code, but they don't know how to test and no unit testing. And Well, that's me. Uh, I, I'm coming from that world. And then we have developers who uh, are guarding the quality of a site that's being used by a lot of people at concurrent uh, points in time. So we want to reduce skew by having those two worlds meet. Um, Developers are scarce, data scientists are scarce. So as soon as you need to work together, uh, the chances of your pro uh, project will reach production uh, decreases. So more autonomy for data scientists. They should, they should be able to do 80%, 90% themselves and rely a bit on developers to, uh, to make sure it's reliable. Um, because data science products are also fairly new in the company, you see all kinds of niche solutions people build um, that that team knows very well, but other teams don't really know it. There's not much visibility. And if, as you have different buildings now, 200 people generating this stuff, um, reusage is also not that, that uh, self-evident. So we'd like to structure this and promote reusage uh, amongst uh, the products that we have. Um, and if you have components that are reusable, that are visible, um, product owners that want to experiment with it are far easier, far better able to, to do that. Uh, so, and in the end, that's what it's about. They try out new things, they see if it works, goes full on, you try again and learn. Um, so that was my experience. Roman, you wanna dig into the, tool the toolkit? I will stand here next to you, not sit okay. in the front row. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Ben, for the introduction. No, come on. Please cheer, Ben. <laughs> Thank you so much. So. Uh, as, um, as you obviously understood, we had uh, a lot of uh, suboptimal pro uh, processes in the company, in the uh, data science community. Uh, there was a um, duplication of work that causes uh, duplication of bugs. There was uh, a lot of uh, uh, components rebuilt, uh, custom pipelines, and uh, our goal was to design some tooling that will allow us to like, speed up experimentation in. Uh, uh, regarding data science projects, as well as uh, improve quality of um, these, such initiatives. Uh, but before we uh, start discussing on uh, companies that we've built, I would like to start with a comparison of software development process with a regular data science uh, ma machine learning model development process. Uh, in software development, you usually build on uh, top of your success. Uh, but that means that you introduce new components, these uh, components uh, interact with each other, uh, and then uh, they reuse code. So you basically uh, reuse what you've already built. Uh, compared to that, uh, in data science, uh, usually in companies there are not so many data scientists compared to number of uh, engineers, and by that, uh, that means that 
Uh, it's quite often uh, data scientists work in different areas. They use uh, different data sources. They work in different domains. Uh, they build different pipelines, and they come up with different custom uh, pipelines. Uh, and that is uh, suboptimal, what we wanted to fix. If you look, uh, if you look into a bit more detailed uh, process, then it's usually a work like that. So you have a business case, you come up uh, with a labeled data set, then you implement some features, train the model, go back and forth until you're satisfied with your results, and then it um, comes time uh, for deployment. At that time, developer takes whatever is uh, implemented and then re-implements it for production, basically. And here we have a, a data skew, so features are not the same as they were, and yeah, all these co problems come from that. Um, our vision on how to fix that is basically to um, get rid of this core problem when uh, data scientists have his own hockey scripts uh, that he executes in like whatever different places, copying data from his laptop to server, training in one library in another. And we want to ensure that um, all these pipelines are reproducible, that they are basically production pipelines. So they can be, re model can be retrained, uh, automatically features can be reconstructed, and that everything is uh, in your Git repository, for example. How do we do that? So let's go through each of these blocks. Start with a, a constructing offline feature, then train the model, and then uh, come closer to online features where we use Spark Streaming. I hope this is what you uh, came for. Um, so offline features, our goal was basically to here uh, for offline feature construction is to allow data scientists to iterate faster with uh, their uh, machine learning initiatives and also to ensure that we do not have um, duplication of implementation of their features. So the idea is simple is to have central registry of all feature implementations. And um, the one detail that I wanted to mention here is that when you, ha when you think about uh, offline training, then you want values for each record for which you predict, you want values of feature that was valid on the moment when this event happened. So you want really detailed uh, granular feature values data sets uh, where you store your feature values. So we have a uh, central reg registry of implementation of this feature reconstruction uh, logic, and then we have a, one component that is wrapped as a Spark ML transformer that allows you to basically get your data frame, data set, and say, like, I want feature one, feature two, and then it updates your data set with uh, all uh, features that you mentioned. It also allows us uh, to, so why did we do that? It's just because it's a nice way to redistribute knowledge in the Spark uh, machine learning community. And also, it allows us to add the simple Perl bindings. It's implemented uh, first in Scala, but for uh, Spark Transformer, it's easy to write Python bindings. Everything is already there, so data scientists can continue working in their Python notebooks and write uh, Python scripts, just, just use this Thinking. Training the model. Uh, so still data scientists uh, work, with main data scientists expertise is how to produce a reliable model that's not overfitted, not underfitted, uh, just come up with uh, features that work. But uh, currently there is a tendency to uh, automate all this job. There are a couple of things on the market, like uh, Google AutoML, and this one is H2O driverless AI. Uh, that uh, allows you to do an amazing thing. Basically, you upload there your CSV, uh, like a comma-separated uh, file with your feature values and labels. So you give it your label data set, and it automatically analyzes uh, your data set, uh, understands what types of features there, then it uh, encodes categorical features, finds uh, non-trivial fe feature interactions, yeah, so basically it can able with enough computer power that you can uh, afford for, for it to brute force everything. Uh, but I believe it doesn't do just blind brute force. 
does some optimizations. But basically, the idea is that it can come up automatically with a model uh, that is not worse than your best data scientist can do. We're still experimenting with that. Just wanted to show you. Uh, th this is a part of our vision. And next component, where usually data scientists work like ants, uh, constructing online pipeline. The idea is simple. You have your production servers that produce some uh, data streams. The uh, processed and encoded uh, into features and then you have and then you need to be able to read these features with a low latency from your production servers this is an architecture that we came up with that allows us to achieve that so production servers push data through Kafka so it's a, our main transport and uh, Spark streaming application processes Kafka streams and um, computes features, sends data to database. Most, mostly we use Cassandra for that. And also the same Kafka streams sent to Hive for offline uh, analysis and offline feature construction with a normal Spark, which is not pictured here. And then we use uh, Druid as a visualization tool for uh, deeper analysis of your, of, your, of your data and for visualization so you can quite so it's quite nice tooling for uh, drawing, for digging into your data and also drawing different uh, types of uh, visualizations. Of course, when you think about a production pipeline, um, you want it to be stable, and but stable means usually for us at least um, that satisfies our needs is two points is first it should not drop data, so you want all your data to be processed, and by that we, uh, this one we ensure by the fact that Kafka is distributed, we use replication factor of three usually, so data is not lost. Once, it, once it's there, uh, we use uh, some daemon on production server, on our application servers that sends data asynchronously, does bucketing, uh, does uh, retries, does buffering in the case of uh, network not uh, reachable. And it also doesn't slow down our uh, like rendering pages and answering to, like, uh, to, to user requests. Then uh, Spark streaming application, uh, it can basically re-read data in the case of failure, it just rereads the same batch from Kafka streaming and then in Cassandra, it's also stretched to multiple DCs where all the data replicated. So it processes, it doesn't drop data, and the second point is it should be automatically recoverable in the case of failure, uh, in the case of it, if it hangs for some reason on IO operation, on a network operation. Uh, and uh, we basically have a health check for the Spark application, then once it's stuck, it gets killed, restarted, and then it we reprocess the same batch, and yeah, we're good. The problem that mentioned by Ben, that is one of uh, the critical ones for our company, is that we wanted to ensure that um, features that are constructed with pipelines are easily discoverable and that they are easily reusable by data scientists. We have 120 teams in the company uh, with data scientists. That, that's a lot. And um, obviously, everyone comes up with their own implementation. We have this duplication of work that we, we discussed. By having a central a registry, central, central implementation of uh, feature extraction from a database, I mean, so basically uh, the place where you can say, yeah, one feature one, feature two, feature three, and it knows how to get them. We can, we enable like a scaling of, uh, of number of deployed models, and uh, we reduce this uh, work duplication, so features are easily reusable. This one problem, this one is tricky. Um, this one is about, I will, uh, to recap, a problem of uh, when you're 
of when you have difference in implementation of your offline features and online features. This is called training servants queue. Um, that usually happens not only just because your implementation is like different, so you have bugs in like either of uh, implementations, but also because you use different data. That's our most uh, popular reason. And we reduce that by using the same data source for constructing both online and offline parts. Also, we uh, have uh, unit tests for both online and offline uh, implementations, and uh, we use Druid for, we send both online and offline computer features uh, to Druid for visualization, so you can draw different histograms and ensure that you have basically the same, same data, uh, same features. This is the most interesting part, maybe. Uh, we wanted to uh, reduce this gap, bridge the gap between data scientist world and, um, and developers world by enabling data scientists to do almost all the job themselves. So we implemented some tooling that allows data scientists to develop uh, online pipeline, uh, real-time pipeline that constructs features and even deploy it uh, autonomously without help of uh, a developer. So this is so this is basically some set of uh, scripts that allows data scientists to instantiate a new project from a template with some example code, and um, they just uh, update the stream processing logic, uh, and that's it. Everything else is handled automatically, uh, like uh, sending to databases, connecting to databases, reading from Kafka, then uh, checkpointing, uh, logging, monitoring, uh, Dashboard created automatically in Grafana. Um, so all automation, health checks, restarting. So that's quite easy. And they also enable, uh, they also able to launch uh, unit tests on their own laptop. That's cool. Uh, about deployment part, we deploy it into, so with a, another script, they just deploy their, uh, their uh, new application into our container infrastructure. And by doing that, we can be sure that no application will take more resources than it allows to take. And also we restrict access to external resources uh, like databases for only those that are required for this application. By that, we can be sure that it will not interact with other applications, it will not interfere with them. And it's quite safe to allow data scientists to deploy into production their new, newly built uh, application. This piece of software, piece of tooling that we built, we call Feature Encoder inside the company, and it turned out that uh, it's not only, so, so that, that's quite a useful uh, connector, it's easy to use connector to connect different data sources with each other. And we use it not only for feature construction, but also for backfilling data, like uh, once you deployed your online uh, pipeline and you want to backfill database with uh, uh, some historical values, for, with some uh, previous data. And I use the same connector to read from Hive or whatever, and then uh, push data to database. The same uh, tooling also used for by some people for non-data science projects, like just just for as a connector from Kafka to Cassandra, uh, to to Hive or whatever. So this is our kind of final vision of how uh, work in booking uh, will look like for data scientists very soon. So when someone has a labeled data set for which he wants to construct a model. Uh, he just goes into a feature store to the central registry, looks up what features are already there. With some probability, he finds yeah, useful features, implements which are not there. Uh, then he trains a model. Uh, in the nearest future, probably it will be also automatic. And then online, he also have uh, all uh, feature implementations. 
uh, for, for the same features that uh, he used offline. And they are verified, they unit tested, and they are like stable pipelines. Then he deploys his model into, so I did not touch that part, but basically it's a, a REST HTTP service where you deploy your model and then it has a, like two endpoints like uh, give me a prediction and give me some metadata about the model. That, uh, so it's also working in our uh, container infrastructure. That's it. So the whole data scientist work basically uh, turns out just to come up with a labeled data set. Uh, yes. I think it's, that's a quite inspiring and amazing to work on. And learnings that we have. Like first one, which is not obvious actually, not self-evident, but it was not at least in the beginning, that yes, it's possible. Uh, you can enable data scientists to be autonomous in a big company. But at the same time, uh, doing uh, kind of traditional approach is still easier. Uh, it's still easier to construct features offline with their offline scripts and then like as a nightly jobs, uh, synchronize data with online database. So people still do that. In some cases it makes sense. In some cases it's not worth it to invest a lot of time into constructing this pipeline and then there's still some effort in maintaining. And also, uh, another uh, fun learning, uh, when we just build this tooling, we say, hey, we have uh, some standardized toolkit that you use for easy uh, construction of uh, online pipelines. Uh, so they, we call it like feature store. And they say, okay, that's cool. What features do you have there? We say, um, we don't have any, but you can, you can populate. Uh, so and then many people just basically wait for more features to appear. But to, to be implemented by someone. And yeah, while um, the overall um, set of tools you need to build to improve your machine learning pipeline is quite big, uh, it wasn't clear from which point to start. It was, should we start from implementing tooling for online first or for offline? But we chose online and while we worked on that, our vision on how the whole pipeline should look like, it really evolved. So if you're struggling with that, I recommend just to start with something that you feel be more impactful at the moment. Yeah, that's it. That was not a technical presentation. Uh, it was a kind of a broad overview of what we are working on, what our vision is. And if you have uh, more technical questions, we. Uh, very happy to discuss it. Thank you. Cool, let's give a round of applause. Great, uh, great job, super interesting. I think we have some time for a couple questions. Um, go ahead and just walk up to the mic and then we'll sort of answer it. I had a quick question about feature Vader though. I think it was like earlier on in the presentation. Is that just a repository of logic to build certain features from source data, or does it actually you know, fetch to an external system to get some other information and join it in? Like how, yeah, could you just tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, that, that is basically a, a repository of implementations of like pieces of code that in, in this code basically there's a logic on how to where get data, how to transform it to come up with features, and, and yeah, and the, basically knowledge on where, where it's stored. So once you want to get these features, then you, then it knows that, that how to recompute them and if they are not yet. Uh, we have a caching, of course, so once some feature reconstructed, it's offline um, and heavy pro uh, process, so data is there, it's available for everyone. Unless, uh, if it's not, then it's recomputed. So a concrete example would be uh, how many times did someone visit a hotel that had free Wi-Fi? You want to count that, and if the person searches again, you want to know if he searched a lot of times for previous. Uh, and these counter-based uh, features are really popular. So we implemented logic to reconstruct those, uh, and the code uh, deals with uh, low cardinal, high cardinal features, um, and it works uh, pretty much always. Um, and people just have to configure a few parameters, and then uh, we fetch the rest of the data for it. Awesome, thanks. Yeah, we got another one. So, 
The, uh, my question is, what is the current uh, organization of the data scientists and the data engineers and the teams? Or what is your goal? What kind of organization do you want to have, like team organization? Yeah, so currently we have uh, teams that are composed of all the disciplines, like the designers, uh, front-end, uh, developers, product owners, uh, 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 data scientists as well. Um, and we like to work with those small teams that are uh, broad and skill set and focus on individual components of our website. And that's been working quite well, and we keep on working like that. Like uh, one team working of what you presented in this presentation, or there are like multiple teams working on it? So the, the main teams work on uh, uh, the product itself, and then we have uh, infrastructure teams that, that focus on ensuring that uh, MySQL servers uh, keep alive, and, and uh, we are kind of in between those. We work closely together with the product teams, uh, but we provide more infrastructure uh, uh, tooling, uh, and there are not many teams doing that. So most of them are really multidisciplinary uh, product focused. And do you have the data engineering and data scientists in the same team? They are in the product teams, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Do you have a product manager on your particular team? Because basically it seems like there's the end stakeholder is basically all of the product teams, right? Yeah. And yeah, I just sort of build on his question. Yeah, so our team evolved from uh, being a product team and then seeing that we missed on some, uh, some tooling. Um, so we formulated our own uh, objectives in that sense, uh, and now we have more of a formal product owner that liaises with the teams. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, so with reference to the uh, feature store you were talking about and the fact that you're caching the actual values of features, um, how do you deal with things like normalization, one-hot encoding, that sort of thing that you might want to do to features? The, so, for instance, in normalization, as new, new data arrives, the normalization may become, well, wrong. Um, so we now focus on uh, types of features uh, and counters. We, we provide counter-based features. And then uh, if you want to normalize those counts afterwards, that's uh, a step that we don't take care of. So we try to eliminate the, the more complex parts. And if you have all these concurrent users and a year of data, then getting just the, the actual simple numbers, that's already challenging. And we solved that first. Cool. I think that looks like about it. Give people a little bit of time to get coffee and stuff like that. But let's give them another round of applause. That was awesome. Thank you.